Hello students, welcome to lecture 4 of this online course on photonic crystals, fundamentals and applications. Today's lecture will be on electromagnetic properties of materials. So, in this week, uh, we will continue the electromagnetic theory of light starting from the derivation of wave equation from the Maxwell's equations. Then we will discuss some important electromagnetic properties of different materials. So, here is the lecture outline a quick recap of Maxwell's equation that we have seen in the last lecture. We will see how we can derive wave equations from that. We will discuss about the boundary conditions and then we will go into the electromagnetic properties of material. We will discuss about dielectric permittivity epsilon, magnetic permeability mu, conductivity sigma and then we will look into the classification of materials by anisotropy, linearity, magnetization and conductivity. So, that will be our lecture outline today. So, in the last lecture we have seen that Maxwell's equations can be written in terms of static and dynamic fields where E and H fields are independent if we are talking about static conditions like electrostatics or magnetic st magnetostatics where else the fields the electric and magnetic fields are coupled when we talk about dynamics, electrodynamics which actually tells about time varying fields. Okay? So, here you can see that these are the Maxwell's equation in integral form for uh, electrostatics or magnetostatics and this is for electrodynamics. So, here what you can see that these blue terms are the addition when you are talking about time varying or dynamic case. These are the same equations, but in differential form. So, I will not go and repeat these equations. We have seen that in the last lecture, but just to remind you that there are a couple of changes when you go from static to dynamic cases. Okay? Something like curl of E is 0 when you are talking about electrostatics or magnetostatics. Okay? But in the dynamic case, you can actually see that curl of E is nothing but minus dot E. Dot Similarly, Ampere's law which gets modified to Ampere's Maxwell's equations. Okay? So, it, it modifies in this particular form. So, curl of H is now given as J plus J D the displacement current density or you can write the term as dot D dot E that is the time varying electric flux density. So, here in the note it is mentioned that this time varying cases in the time varying cases which are you know the changes that are basically highlighted in blue color for quick visualization. Now, let us start with how to determine the electric and magnetic field propagation through a particular region. right? So, this can be described in the form of wave equation. So, when we talk about wave equation electromagnetic wave equation is nothing but a second order partial differential equation that describes the propagation of electromagnetic wave through a particular medium or in vacuum. So, here you can see that the electric and magnetic fields are coupled to each other and they are oscillating in their own uh, plane and then this is the wave propagation direction. The homogeneous form of the equation written in terms of either electric field or magnetic field is called the wave equation. So, typically it looks like this. So, you have Laplacian of electric field vector which is a function of position and time that is equal to 1 over v square v is basically the phase velocity of the wave propagating in a particular medium and then you have the second order partial derivative with respect to time of that particular vector field. So, the same equation could have been written in terms of magnetic field as well. So, instead of E you could have placed B and that will give you again the wave equation. So, our goal here is to determine how the wave equation can be derived from Maxwell's equation. So, to start with let me throw a vector identity okay? and this is basically a mathematical manipulation that is true for all magnetic fields. So, curl of curl of H can be written as um, gradient of the divergence of that particular field minus the Laplacian of the field. Okay? So, once we know that vector identity, we can actually use the curl equation okay, to obtain the uh, wave equation. 
So we we'll start with curl of E, which is minus dot E. dot B can be written as mu h, so you can also write it at minus mu dot h dot E. Now in this equation, if you take curl on both the sides, you get curl of curl of E, which is nothing but minus mu dot dot E. H will now be replaced with curl of H. Now, if you consider that we are in a source-free region, that means there is no charge or current flowing anywhere, we can actually take this gradient term as zero. Okay. So what happens? This curl of curl of H can be simply written as minus Laplacian of H. So this is how you can actually compute this. H can be uh, written in terms of the three uh, components hx, hy and hz. So you can finally write this equation in this particular form that curl of curl of h equals minus del square h. Remember this is for the case where we are assuming that we are in a source free region that is there is no charge or no current is flowing. So if you replace this by electric field you get curl of curl of e is nothing but minus del square e. So, how do you get that? So, what, what we have till now? We, we know that curl of curl of e is nothing but minus del square e okay? and that can be written from the previous one. So, curl of curl of e we have obtained that it is basically this term the right hand side. So, you can equate those two here. So, you equate those two here. Okay? So, this is what we get. Right, curl of curl of E is minus Laplacian of E, which can be written as mu dot dot T of curl of H. Now, curl of H can be replaced by this J plus dot D dot T. Now, remember we are talking about a source free region, so we can uh, take J equals 0. Okay? So, what we are left with? We are only left with this term, and D can be written as epsilon E. Okay, so you can take out epsilon is a constant, so you can take it out from this derivation. So you get dot dot t of dot e dot t. So what is this basically? This is nothing but dot square e dot e square, and you have mu epsilon, and this term is nothing but minus Laplacian of e. So you can simply write del square e is nothing but this term mu epsilon dot square e by dot e square. So this is your vector wave equation. Okay. So the connection between the electromagnetic optics and wave optics is now more evident as you can see that the wave equation which is the basis of wave optics is basically embedded in the structure of electromagnetic theory. Um, the speed of the electromagnetic wave is related to the two important electromagnetic constants epsilon and mu and we can actually compute the speed by comparing the these two forms of uh, the wave equation where you can write del square E equals mu naught epsilon naught and epsilon R. So mu naught is vacuum permeability, epsilon naught is vacuum permittivity and epsilon R is relative permittivity. Right? So when you compare this wave equation with this particular form, so you can see that 1 over V square is nothing but this term. So you can write V square equals 1 over epsilon naught mu naught mu naught epsilon naught epsilon r so this term 1 over mu naught epsilon naught can be written as c naught square where c naught is the speed of light in vacuum so that is how you can actually correlate the phase velocity with you know the velocity in that particular uh, in vacuum divided by the permittivity of uh, the medium in which the wave is propagating so it is basically v square. So from this you can also see that if you take the square root of it you can simply get v equals c naught over square root epsilon r. So square root epsilon r is basically the refractive index of the medium and that is the definition of refractive index basically. So refractive index tells you the ratio of the you know vacuum ratio of the speed of light in vacuum to the speed of light in that particular medium. So that is how you can actually get n. So the relationship between n and epsilon r in a non-absorbing media is basically very simple. It's n equals square root of epsilon r, right? So all these parameters you should uh, remember. It's like very very basic things. Mu naught is four pi into ten to the power minus seven Henry per meter. Epsilon naught is eight point eight five four into ten to the power minus twelve. 
farad per meter and this is the speed of light. So, we typically take this as 3 into 10 to the power 8 meter per second. So, to keep the calculations easy. So, C naught is basically computed as 1 over square root of mu naught epsilon naught. Now, coming to the boundary conditions. This is very important when you want to solve the, you know, field equations at different boundaries of medium. Okay, whenever there will be two medium coming next to each other, there will be a boundary and you have to find out the conditions that take your fields across the boundary. So, then at the interface of two media of different optical properties, the optical field component must satisfy certain boundary conditions. Now, what are those? So, the boundary conditions basically describe the electromagnetic fields such as, you know, the electric field electric displacement field D, the magnetic field H and also the magnetic you know displacement field or magnetic flux density B. Now, if you consider a source free region, so we can say that the tangential components of E and H must be continuous across the interface while the normal components of the flux density or the displacement fields D and B must be also continuous. So, here you can see this is medium 1 and this is medium 2 and this is the boundary. So, what we are saying basically the tangential component of H that can be calculated as n cap uh, cross product with H 1. Similarly, this is the tangential component of the magnetic field in the second medium. These two should be continuous. Okay. Similarly, the electric field also should be continuous and this is basically the normal to the interface. So, the normal component of the electric flux density or electric displacement displacement field. So, d 1 n should be equal to d 2 n. Similarly, the magnetic flux density or magnetic displacement field uh, b 1 n should be equal to b 2 n. So, these boundary conditions can also be derived from Maxwell's condition. So, always remember, so in this particular case, we are considering that there is no surface charge. So, what we have seen that the curl equations are basically giving us the tangential components of the field at the boundary. Okay? So, we are basically looking at n cap cross E1 will be equal to n cap cross E2. Similarly, n cap cross H1 should be equal to n cap cross uh, h2. What is n cap? n cap is basically this vector. Okay. So, when you take the curl, you basically get the tangential components. Similarly, if you look into the divergence equations, we are basically getting the dot products with n cap. So, we are basically looking into the normal components okay, of uh, d and b. So, you can say n cap d1 should be equal to n cap d2 and n cap b1 should be equal to n cap b2. So, when there is no surface charge, we understood that the tangential components of the E and H must be continuous across the interface while the normal components of D and B are continuous. Now, what happens when there is surface charge present or there is some current density? So, now let us look into the boundary conditions and how they will change if there is some surface charge or current density presents. Okay? So, the concept of surface charge density will have very practical uh, usefulness in this case. Okay? So, we have seen that it is often very convenient mathematically to define regions you know, where the electric and magnetic fields are 0. Now, let us assume that there is a plane boundary condition or plane boundary surface at z equals 0 separating two region, region 1 and region 2. So, region 2 is at the bottom, region 1 is at the top and this surface is basically at z equals 0. Okay? So, we can derive the boundary conditions for H by using a small pill box as shown in this particular figure by letting this uh, delta z to 0. Now, the media occupying such region are called perfect conductors which are basically idealization of media where the field inside are considered to be vanishingly small. So, in that case we can assume that all fields in uh, region 2 are basically 0. So, you can say E2 equals H2 equals B2 equals D2 all are equal to 0. 
Now, we are assuming that electric charges and currents are located primarily on a very thin layer on the surface of the perfect conductor. Thus, on the surface of the perfect conductor, we assume uh, rho is infinite uh, and contained in a zero thickness medium. So, this is what is the surface uh, charge density in that case. Uh, rho s will be you know rho delta z where z tends to 0. So, if we can we know that d2 is already 0 because there is nothing below the surface whereas, n cap d1 is not 0 because there is the surface charge density. So, n cap d1 is basically rho s. So, you can see there is a difference between the d field components now which are normal to the boundary surface and the difference is equal to that surface charge density which is lying at the boundary surface. Similarly, now we can assume that Jx and Jy to be infinite to create a surface charge density Js when delta z tends to 0. So, you can write Js e equals to uh, j delta z. Okay? So, the value of z, j tends to infinity, but then we are operating in a limit where the pillbox is infinitely uh, thin. So, it is z tends to 0. So, that is how you actually get surface current density. right? So, in that case, you can write that wh whereas your h2, the magnetic field in region 2 is 0, but the tangential component of the magnetic field in region 1 that is n cap cross product with h1 is not 0 rather it is the surface current density j s. So, here we can see that there is a discontinuity in the tangential component of the magnetic field and that is equal to the surface current at the boundary surface. So, finally, we can rewrite the boundary conditions in the presence of surface charge and current density as we can see in this particular table. So, if you write it in terms of vector field, so here you know these are continuous. So, you can write it as uh, n cap or you can write E n cap okay, cross with E 1 minus E 2 is 0. So, that is where the tangential component of the electric field is continuous, but whenever there is uh, you know some surface current. So, the tangential component of the magnetic field shows discontinuity and the difference between the two is given by this uh, current density. So, you can simply write h t 1 minus h t 2 equals j s this is the scalar form okay? and in the uh, in the vector form the tangential component is calculated by the cross product. Okay? And if you talk about discontinuity of the normal uh, electric flux density. So, you can simply write d n 1 minus d n 2 equals rho s that is the scalar form and in the vector form this is calculated as a dot product with the n cap vector. So, you could have simply written n cap or you can write e n cap the both same thing this is a unit vector along the surface normal and the difference between d 1 minus d 2 that gives you rho s. Okay? And this is how your magnetic field is continuous across the surface and uh, across the boundary and this is how you can write it. So, you can actually see that the presence of uh, the surface charge density and surface current basically affects these two equations that the tangential component of magnetic field will no longer be continuous there will be a discontinuity and the amount of discontinuity is given by the surface current. Similarly, the normal component of the electric flux will not be continuous the discontinuity is given by that surface charge density. Right. So, now let us look into the electromagnetic properties of material. Okay. So, now we will see how electromagnetic wave behaves differently in different material while propagating. So, in other words, you can say that how several materials can be classified based on their electromagnetic properties. So, we can start with the constitutive uh, relations where we can define the fundamental electromagnetic properties of uh, materials. So, three fundamental properties as you can see one is electric permittivity epsilon 
magnetic permeability mu and electric conductivity uh, sigma right so these are the constitutive relations so d equals epsilon e so this tells you about the electric response of the material b equals mu h it tells you about the magnetic response of the material and j equals sigma e it tells you about the ohm law or electrical conductivity of the material right so um, if you want to understand what happens with electric response this is basically um, dielectric permittivity this epsilon is basically a diagnostic physical property which characterizes the degree of electrical polarization a material experiences under the influence of an external electric field similarly from the magnetic response you can say that magnetic permeability is a measure how well a medium stores magnetic energy right and sigma is how well it conducts the field so at first uh, we will define the electric uh, dielectric permittivity epsilon okay and uh, this permittivity is uh, closely related to the capacitance okay so you can see that uh, dielectric permittivity is basically a measure of how well a medium stores electric energy so it can be thought of as a measure of how much interaction an electric field has with the medium it resides in. So, the permittivity epsilon can be defined as a ratio of the electric field E and D. So, you can actually see that uh, epsilon naught can be written as D over E, right? So, you can say permittivity is basically the ratio between the electric field E and the corresponding electric displacement. So, if you want to understand how displacement looks like, so this is a pictorial representation of that. So, what happens? This is a non-polarized material. So, you have uh, nucleus, okay, positive nucleus and then you have electron cloud, okay. So, these are basically representing unpolarized atomic elements. But when you expose this material to an electric field, the bound electrical charges of uh, opposite sign they will try to you know separate from each other and the extent of the separation of the electrical charges within a material is represented by the electric polarization so you can say that in this particular material where there is no electric field present the displacement is also zero polarization is also zero here you can see the polarization is basically epsilon minus epsilon naught into e so, there is an effective displacement in the presence of this electric field and that is D equals epsilon E. Okay? So, the electric field displacement and polarization they are related by this particular expression. So, you can write that D equals epsilon naught E plus P and this two together you can simply write epsilon E. Okay. Now, we will define the constitutive relations for a linear homogeneous and isotropic medium. Now, in linear media, the properties of the material do not depend on the strength of the field. It means here the polarization P is linearly proportional to E. So, you can simply write P equals epsilon naught chi E. So, what is chi? Chi is basically a scalar constant that is called the electric susceptibility. Then we can write D equals epsilon naught E plus P. So, P you can replace with epsilon naught chi E. You can take E common. You have epsilon naught 1 plus chi. And this 1 plus chi is nothing but your relative permittivity epsilon R. So, I believe and this one epsilon naught and epsilon R together can be written as simply epsilon. So, that is how all these equations are related D equals epsilon E or you can write epsilon naught epsilon R E or you can write epsilon naught 1 plus chi times E. Okay? So, this is how you can correlate you know uh, the displacement field with permittivity, the vacuum permittivity, relative permittivity or susceptibility. Now, when you come to magnetic permeability mu, Okay, so inside a material medium, as we have seen, the permittivity is determined by the electrical properties of the medium. Permeability will be determined by the magnetic property of the medium, right? So, magnetic permeability is nothing but a measure 
of how well a medium stores magnetic energy. So when exposed to a magnetic field, applied magnetic field, the collection of individual magnetic dipole moments within most material will attempt to reorient themselves along the direction of the field. So this will generate an induced magnetization and it contributes towards the net magnetic flux density inside the material. So the degree in which the induced magnetism or magnetization impacts the magnetic flux density depends on the material's magnetic permeability. So magnetic permeability can be defined as a ratio between the magnetic flux density B within a material and the intensity of an applied magnetic field H. So you can say mu is nothing but a ratio of B and H. So mu equals B by H, okay, provided that the fields are sufficiently weak. So if you want to write B in terms of mu naught H, so this is the vacuum uh, permeability plus mu naught m, m is the measure of magnetization of the material and these two together can be written as mu h, okay. So mu naught is basically permeability of the free space and mu is the permeability of that particular medium. The next important parameter is conductivity and it describes the degree to which a material conducts electricity. So this is purely associated with the electric field. Okay. So, when an electric field is applied to a material, free charges within the material will experience an electrical force which is also known as Coulomb force. So, this force will cause the free charges to move through the material along the direction of the applied field okay. and that is how you will get a, so the electrons will the negative charges or electrons will move in the opposite direction of the applied field and the holes will move in the direction of the electric field. So you are basically getting a current. So the current will be in the direction of uh, the flow of holes or in the opposite direction of the flow of electrons, right. So the ease at which the electrical charges move through a material under the influence of an external electric field depends on the materials electrical conductivity. So, you can say that when electric field is applied, okay, you can get a surface current density J equals sigma E and once you know J, if you take a cross section of A, so if you multiply J and A, you are getting a current I across this particular uh, cross section, right. So, electrical conductivity can be defined as a ratio of the current density J within a material and the electric field E and this relationship is also known as Ohm's law. So J equals sigma E. So what is sigma? C is sigma is nothing but J by E. Sigma is also the reciprocal of the uh, resistivity. So this is conductivity, this is resistivity, okay. So current density is basically defined as electrical current per unit cross sectional area. In many cases, the electrical properties of a material are characterized by the electrical resistivity rho, okay. So rho is nothing but the reciprocal of the electrical conductivity. So you can see the, you know, the unit is basically ohm meter. So how do you get uh, the velocity that you have already discussed? So when you compare the two um, wave equation forms, you can see that this particular quantity will be equated to this one. So you can simply write V square equals 1 over epsilon naught mu naught times 1 over epsilon r. So that is basically C0 square that is the vacuum, uh, C0 is nothing but the speed of light in vacuum and epsilon r, okay. Now as I mentioned already that there is a relationship with refractive index as well. So if you take square root of this particular equation, you will get V equals C naught by square root epsilon r and that is nothing but your n in a media which is non-absorbing. So you can say n is nothing but the ratio of C by V which is square root of epsilon r which can be also written as square root of 1 plus chi. So if you know the electrical susceptibility of a material, you can also find out what is the refractive index and that is basically telling you the speed of light in that particular 
medium. So now let us uh, classify uh, the materials by different electromagnetic properties. We have already seen that. So let us see how do, you, how do we classify materials by anisotropy. Now when I, when I say anisotropy, first I need to understand what is isotropic. So when I say isotropic, it means the properties are independent of the direction of the field. Something like this, D equals epsilon E, B equals mu H, J equals sigma E. All these properties epsilon, mu and sigma are independent of the direction of the field. So, okay. so by isotropy, we can say that you know E field is basically proportional to D and H field is proportional to B and so on. But when you bring anisotropy, it means the properties now depend on the direction of the field. It means E field is no longer parallel to D and H field is no longer parallel to B. So you can actually represent um, these parameters as tensors. So if medium is electrically anisotropic, if it is described by a permittivity tensor, which is given by this and it has a scalar permeability. Whereas we can call a medium as magnetically anisotropic if its permeability is basically described by a tensor and it has a scalar dielectric permittivity. So for anisotropic medium, the constitutive relationships can be written in general form something like D equals um, epsilon double bar that is also another representation of the tensor permittivity tensor and then you have the electric field right similarly b equals uh, permeability tensor times the magnetic field so these properties are basically independent of the direction of the fields okay the crystals are described in general by symmetric uh, permittivity tensors so there always exists a coordinate transformation that would transform that symmetric matrix into a diagonal matrix and in this coordinate system called the principal system you will see that the tensor basically looks like this where it will only have the diagonal elements okay epsilon x epsilon y and epsilon z so these are the permittivity that you can see along x y and z direction respectively now let us assume that the principal axis of the crystal looks like this the permittivity is given like this. Now, if you take you know cubic crystal where x, y, and z are all same, so it becomes an isotropic. But if you consider tetragonal, hexagonal, or rhombohedral crystals where two of these parameters will be equal, so this kind of uh, crystals are basically called uniaxial crystals. So maybe epsilon x and epsilon y are equal, and epsilon z is different. So in that case, you can simply write epsilon, epsilon in two cases and epsilon z will be written differently. So this is how the permeability, per permittivity sensor of a uniaxial crystal will look like. Fine. Now, what happens to the permittivity of uh, along z direction? If it is greater than the permittivity of these two, we can say that this is a positive uniaxial crystal. If in the other case where epsilon z is smaller than epsilon, we can call it as negative uniaxial crystal. Now, there are crystals which are also biaxial. These are basically orthorhombic, monoclinic and triclinic crystal where all epsilon x, epsilon y and epsilon z are unequal. Okay? So, when all of them are unequal, the medium is biaxial. It means every direction will have a different dielectric permittivity. So now let us see how the materials can be classified as linear and nonlinear medium. So when you say linear medium, here the property of the material does not depend on the strength of the field. Okay? So the electric polarization P is basically linearly proportional to electric field E. So you can simply write P equals epsilon naught chi E, where chi is the electric susceptibility. Thus, you can write D equals epsilon naught E plus P. So P can be replaced by epsilon naught chi E. You can take this common and this is what we have seen till now. right? 
Now, if you go to a nonlinear medium, there the properties basically depend on the intensity of the field. So, in a nonlinear medium, the electromagnetic response can often be described by expressing the polarization P as a power series in the field strength E. So, you can write polarization as epsilon naught chi 1 E t plus chi 2 E square t plus chi 3 E cube t and so on. So, you are actually seeing that you are getting higher order terms, nonlinear terms okay, like this because of the higher field intensity or strength. These quantities chi 2 and chi 3, they are known as second and third order nonlinear optical susceptibilities, right. Now, so that was about the, you know, classification of materials by electric fields, okay, properties. Let us now classify materials by magnetization property. So, we are basically talking about magnetic materials, they are the constitutive relationship is nothing but B equals mu naught H plus mu naught M that is B equals mu H. Now, a magnetic material is basically uh, diamagnetic if mu is smaller than the vacuum permeability mu naught. That means, the relative permittivity mu R which is basically the ratio of mu over mu naught is less than 1. So, some example for this kind of material is bismuth, copper, zinc, etc. So, diamagnetism is basically caused by induced magnetic moments that tend to oppose the externally applied magnetic field. So, when a um, diamagnetic material is placed in a magnetic field, the external field is partially expelled and the magnetic flux density within it is slightly reduced. The other type is called paramagnetic. So, if your mu r that is the ratio of mu and mu naught is greater than 1, we call it paramagnetic. Examples are manganese, aluminum, chromium, platinum, etc. So, paramagnetism is due to alignment of magnetic moments. So, when a paramagnetic material such as platinum is placed in magnetic field, it becomes slightly magnetized in the direction of the external field. And the third category is called ferromagnetic. So, here if you know relative permeability is not constant and it is very large. Example of this kind of material is iron, cobalt and nickel. So, what happens in a ferromagnetic material such as iron, it does not have a constant relative permeability. As the magnetization, magnetizing field increases, the relative permeability increases and it will reach a maximum and then it will decrease. Okay? So, these are the three different types of materials that can be uh, classified based on magnetization properties. So, purified iron and many magnetic alloys have maximum relative permeabilities of 100,000 or more based on this. Now, let us classify materials based on conductivity. Now, on the basis of the relative values of electrical conductivity sigma or the resistivity rho which is basically reciprocal of sigma, the solids can be broadly classified as metals where they possess very low resistivity or you can say very high conductivity. So, sigma is much much larger than 1. Then you have semiconductors where they have you know conductivity intermediate to metals and insulator. It means they have something in between uh, metal and insulator. So, insulator are basically those which have very high resistivity or you can say very low conductivity that is sigma is much much less than 1 in case of insulators. So, there is here is a table that actually tells you about the different properties of conductor, semiconductor and insulator. So, resistivity for conductor is in the range of 10 to the power minus 6 to 10 to the power minus 8 ohm per meter okay? and um, for semiconductor, it is 10 to the power minus uh, 4 to 0 0.5 and insulator, it is very, very high 10 to the power 7 to 10 to the power 16. So, conductivity will be inverse of it and you can see the unit is more per meter. So, the temperature coefficient of resistance 
for conductor it is positive it means with temperature the resistance increases for semiconductor is negative so it's other way similarly for insulator also it is other way he in conductor the current is mainly because of the free electrons in semiconductor it is because of both uh, you know electrons and holes insulators do not support any current conductor do not have any energy gap semiconductors have energy gap ranging from 0 to 1 electron volt or sometimes a little more and then insulators have more than 6 electron volt so examples of conductors are platinum aluminum copper silver semiconductor you all know these are germanium silicon you know gallium arsenide and so on okay and then insulators are like wood plastic etc so with that we come to an end to this lecture we'll start discussion on electromagnetism as an eigenvalue problem in the next lecture so if you have any doubt or query regarding this lecture or any of the previous lectures you can send your query to this email address mentioning MOOC and photonic crystal on the subject line thank you mm -hmm.